verses 4, 23, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You know, we, um, we would be labeled by many, and we would claim it ourselves, to be fundamentalists. Back when that word was a good word. <laughs> uh, the world has twisted it and turned it and so on, but... Uh, some years ago, there were people who were concerned that folks were moving away from the, the Word of God. And uh, so they came out with the fundamentals of the faith. And uh, we believe them. I mean, we believe the Bible is God's Word. We believe that Christ is the only way to heaven. Uh, you, you, know, you, can, you can go on and on. But you know, I've, I've known people who their worship of God is more ceremonial than real. Uh, there's those who, they'll only use the King James Bible but they won't actually do what it says. And the point is not to worship the pages of a book. We worship the Lord and we honor his word. And a real fundamental of the faith is our heart. It's so important. Uh, one of the most fundamental things is that our heart be right with God through his word. He uses a couple of words there that are really important when he says, keep, keep thy heart. It's the word guard. And if you've ever seen somebody guarding something, usually they have a gun. <laughs> you know, they're serious about it. And he says, keep thy heart with all diligence. That word means watch. It's sometimes translated imprison. He's saying this is, this is something that is really, you need to be careful. You need to watch. And when you think about your heart, you know, we're, we're afflicted with things all the time that affect our heart. Um, there's problems. Anger, fear, bitterness, lust, dishonesty. You know, there's all kinds of things that are, are pushing at our heart. A moment by moment. And we're all the same. I, I face the same things you do. God says, guard your heart. Keep those out. You know, this, this is not like a prison. This is more like a vault. God values your heart. He wants to be the one who possesses your heart. And when he says, keep thy heart with all diligence, he's saying, keep those things out. Don't, don't let them take over. There's also a lot of ex experiences that will affect our heart. A lot of them have to do with people. Uh, some of them have to do with our health, uh, our work, our, our culture, our heredity, our marriage. Uh, you know, there's a lot of experiences that will affect our heart. And be careful you don't use those as an excuse for letting in something that God says, no, that shouldn't be in your heart. God says, guard your heart. Don't let your experience uh, control or define you. Sometimes you'll meet someone and immediately they'll, they'll tell you of some experience they had in the past that defines them instead of letting the Lord be Lord of, of their life and, and of their heart. The issue, see, the issue of our heart is what comes out of it. Guard your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. And uh, this is a, a very meaningful message to me this morning because you know, I have to do the same things. You know, I fight fear and you know, a, lot, a lot of things that, that afflict me. Uh, but God wants me to guard my heart. He wants him to be in control. You know, some of the verses we learned this week were so helpful at Holiday Kids Club. I, I mean, I knew them already. Uh, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You know, when my emotions are afflicting me or circumstances are trying to, to change me, Listen, I can, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Amen. Uh, the other one, the thing that made me think of it, I'd ask you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32. We, uh, we sang verse 32 in Holiday Kids Club. And I think it was either the first day or the second day, I heard a butcher bird whistling the first three notes of the song. I thought, man, he just knows, be kind, be kind. And I told one of the kids, then he goes out and kills another bird. <laughs> He's like, like a lot of people. Uh, Ephesians 4, verses 31 and 32. God says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. See, that's what he's saying. Don't let that in your heart. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. See, God wants us to be tenderhearted. Uh, toward people, toward him. Oftentimes, we're, we're the opposite. 
You know, we're hard-hearted towards people and towards God, and we're tender-hearted towards all these things that want to mess us up, you know. Oh, I've got every right to be angry. No. God says, put that off. Put that off. See, the opposite of tender-hearted is hard-hearted. If you turn to Hebrews chapter 3, the illustration God gives is the nation of Israel as they're leaving Egypt. You probably know the story. Uh, they had ended up slaves in Egypt 400 years. I'll just mention this in passing. Israel is an amazing story. You don't get nations that move from place to place and are still nations and then still go back to their homeland. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a miracle of God that Israel is a nation. But anyway, uh, they had been in Egypt for 400 years. And God used that to make them a nation that would never break. But anyway, uh, on their way back, God had set them free. They're on their way back. And if, if you know the story, God had used 10 miracles to set them free. Amazing things. Uh, you know, Moses touching the water with his rod and it turns to blood. Man, that'd shake you up, wouldn't it? <laughs> Uh, and, and all the things that he did, and then as, they, as they're leaving, they're just a little ways on the way, they don't have enough water. That, that's the story behind Hebrews 3, verse 8. He says, Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Again, if you know the story, because they wouldn't believe God, they spent an extra 40 years waiting around in, in the desert. You know, all that God had done, and then they just... They get to a place where they need some water and they say, oh, God can't do it. Yeah, I've talked to a lot of people where they have a situation in their life, a relationship, a, a health problem, a, a, you know, a marriage problem, whatever. Oh, God can't help. And they harden their heart to what God wants to do. You know, a lot of times we set a, a goal. We say, here's what God has to do. And if God doesn't do it, I don't, he may not even be there. Well, let me tell you something. He's God, not you, not me. And God can use some amazing things. God could use Egypt to make Israel a nation. Imagine that. God, God thought, now let's see. Let's have them be slaves in Egypt for 400 years. That'll help. <laughs> We'd never think of that. But let me tell you, they're a nation today. How many, you know, what's that, 4,000 years later? They're still going. God made them a nation. And God can use things in our life that we just can't imagine. Why? It's going on. And God doesn't mind when we ask why. He just doesn't have to tell us <laughs> immediately. You know, someday in heaven, we'll say, oh, that's why he was doing that. You know, it's like these mazes. You think, oh, why would I go here? Well, you get up above and say, oh, that's why we go that way. And God does that with circumstances, with problems, with so on. And he says, be tenderhearted. Be tenderhearted. The, the problem with hard-heartedness, you see down in verses 12 and 13, he says, Take heed, brethren, Hebrews 3, verse 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the, the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You see what hardens us? Sin and unbelief. And he says the time to deal with it is today. Don't put it off. Don't think, oh, I'll, I'll work this out tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow can be 20 years, 50 years. But we need to guard against those negative things that will harden our heart. But you know what? We also need to guard for what should be in there. So when God says, keep thy heart with all diligence, he's saying, partly there's things you need to keep out. But he's also saying there's need, things you need to keep in. That's what I want to look at uh, this, this morning. Uh, that word diligence... In Proverbs 4.23, 12 times in the Bible is translated ward. Do you know what a ward is in the Bible? It's a prison. <laughs> He's saying this is something you're guarding. You're keeping something in. And so we're going to look at that, that, that positive side. Now, I would compare it maybe to a vault, you know, where you got your family treasure or whatever. Uh, and I noticed three things in particular. You can't look at, uh, in one sermon, you can't look at everything in the Bible, but... Um, although I've heard sermons where I think they've tried. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, as, as Paul wrote to, to Timothy, he names three things, and I think those things, three things will help us. 1 Timothy 1, verse 2, Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Three things. Those are fundamentals. 
He says the same thing to him when he writes again in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 2. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and, Jesus, and Christ Jesus our Lord. And one of the things I noticed in those introductions was they're from the Lord. These are not things we earn or things we work up ourselves. They're from the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace. Let's look at those three things just briefly this, this morning. Uh, there's a whole lot more you can learn. Uh, let me encourage you, you know, as the Lord speaks to your heart this morning, uh, get into God's Word and find out more about grace, mercy, and peace, and then the things that it leads on to from there. Grace is receiving something good that you don't deserve. Sometimes we call it a favor. I found this. If you do somebody a favor long enough, they assume that you have to do it. <laughs> uh, but you don't. A favor is something you do not because they earn it or they deserve it. Uh, you do it at, at your own goodwill. And you know, as Christians, we've received that. We, we, we sing the song Amazing Grace. We didn't sing it this morning, but uh, you know, uh, mercy there was great and grace was free. And that's exactly it. God's riches at Christ's expense. We've received it. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It's grace. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. Salvation is not of works. And let me just add here, that's the difference between Christianity and religion. Religion will say, here's the rules. You keep these and maybe you'll get to heaven. <laughs> that's not grace. God says, you're a sinner. I died for those sins. You need the gift of salvation. I can give it to you if you'll ask. That's grace. The Bible says every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God doesn't change. He's always good. No matter what's going on around us, God is always good. And God is always full of grace. And the, the point I want to make this morning is, as we've received it, so we need to give it. He talks in Colossians. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. As Christians, we should, we should be some of the most cheerful people on earth. That doesn't mean we'll never cry and we'll never be sad. But we have hope and we have uh, the joy of the Lord, the fruit of the Spirit. Colossians 3.16 is where he says, Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Uh, uh, verse, uh, verse 10, he says, We've put on the new man. And God has, has made us new. Look at verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. And he gives a whole list of things that we need to make sure are in our vault, <laughs> that we're guarding. Bowels of mercies. That just means a heart of compassion. Kindness. Humbleness of mind. Boy, there's a hard one. You know, when you're talking to somebody, you know the one who's always right? It's you. <laughs> we need to have humbleness of mind. Meekness. Long-suffering. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another if any man have a quarrel against any. Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So he says these are things that we need to make sure are in our hearts. Above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. And then he ties it to the word of God. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and Spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Grace. One of the things I, I realized about this is that's how we minister to others. The way we minister to others is by grace. I'm not quite sure even how to say this, but people don't deserve our ministry, we give it. People don't earn our, our work and, and our blessing and our help. We give it. Like God gave to us. We don't deserve God's grace. You know, having the, the kids here this week, they didn't deserve that or earn it. We gave it. And we're happy to do so. And we're blessed because of it. Yeah, some amazing little kids, you know, and you see the potential for, I, I've, I've gotten almost to where I hate the word potential because you know it can be potential for good or for evil. <laughs> uh, but, you know, what God can do if, he get a, if they just let him get a hold of their, their lives. And, uh, you know, if you have a problem with ministry, with showing grace, 
The Bible says it's a heart problem. Uh, look at 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And one of the reasons I keep this in mind, I, I'm constantly trying to minister to people, and if you're not careful, you'll get to where you resent it. You know, you think, oh, they don't, they don't appreciate it. Well, listen, if that's the reason you're doing it, you're going to quit. If you're doing it to get people to appreciate you, listen, that, that dog don't hunt. <laughs> uh, we do it by grace. 2 Corinthians 6, um, verse 1, for instance, he says, We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. That's an interesting verse. How can we receive the grace of God in vain? The word vain means useless. If you get saved and you won't show grace to others, you've received the grace of God in vain. It hasn't done what it's supposed to do. Uh, verse uh, 3, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as, as the ministers of God. You, you know, we don't want the ministry uh, to be blamed. We want God to be glorified. Uh, we need to serve by grace. And uh, if we have a problem with that, look at verse 12, 1 Corinthians 6, 12. He uses a, a little bit of an archaic word, but we still use it. You're not straightened in us. It means you're not limited. You're not restricted in us, but you're I'm sorry, straightened in your own bowels, your own heart. He said if you're limited in showing grace, he said it's not the pastor's fault. It's not the church's fault. It's your fault. <laughs> Now, we don't like that, do we? But, you know, we've got to deal with it. I've got to deal with that. I can't look at people and say, oh, why aren't they doing this? Well, listen, why aren't I doing this? That's the one I've got to look at. It's me. It's me, oh, Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And, uh, you know, grace is a wonderful thing. Yeah, aren't you glad you received grace? That you have, haven't gotten what you deserved? Now, there's the song we, we sing, freely you've received, freely give. This comes from Scripture. Uh, we don't deserve God's blessing, and we need to make sure we don't make others earn our blessings. God wants us to minister to people, and we do it by grace. You know, the very people Jesus ministered to hung him on the cross. And on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Man, we need a dose of God's grace. The other word that, that Paul used commonly was mercy. Man, I like mercy. You ever been stopped by a policeman? And he doesn't give you a ticket, he gives you a warning, or she. You think, wow, thank you. Whew. Of course, if they give you a ticket, you know, you, you know, oh, they, they should find real criminals. <laughs> Mercy. Uh, judgment you deserve that's withheld. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. And if you're saved, you've received it. Listen, if we got what we deserved, every one of us would be in hell right now. Right. Not tomorrow, not next week. Right now, we'd be in hell. But God has showed us mercy. The Bible says God is long-suffering. You read in the scriptures of people's hundreds of years being in rebellion against God, and finally God will say, okay, that's enough. And the world looks at it and says, what a cruel God. No, that's a merciful, long-suffering God. We've experienced God's mercy. We're like those blind men. Do you remember the, the fellows in scripture? Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus turned and opened their eyes. What a blessing to know God's mercy. The Bible talks about the mercy seat. You familiar with the Ark of the Covenant and the, the angels that were over? And the, the, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant is called the mercy seat. And once a year, the high priest would come in and put the blood of the sacrifice on that mercy seat. And you know, Christ is the, is the one who, who gave his blood to cleanse us. He's our mercy seat. The Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. We go to him for mercy because he's paid the price for our sins. We rejoice in mercy. We love it when mercy is shown to us. Psalm 13, verse 5, he says, I've trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. It's a blessing to know God's mercy and God's grace. Now, I mentioned, we, we sang, mercy there was great and grace was free. What a blessing. There's another song, when I deserve judgment, he gave me mercy. Now we need to practice mercy towards others. Let, there, there's some really 
hard warnings on this in Scripture. James 2.13, he says, He shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. And of course, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. The Bible tells us to guard our heart. These are two really basic areas. These are fundamentals, grace and mercy. We want it from the Lord. If you're saved, you've received it from the Lord. And now, in as best we can, by God's help, we need to show this to others. This will change your home. This will change your, your community. This would change our, our country if we would show grace and mercy. I remember a man asking me, and I realized after he'd asked me several times that he, uh, he, he thought Christianity wouldn't work. He said, what if everybody lived by the Bible? I said, well, we wouldn't have to have locks on our doors. and We wouldn't have to have all the laws we have. Everybody just do what's right and kind and decent and good. You know, the world thinks if you live by the Bible, it would be a terrible world. Listen, it would be great if we just follow some of the simple basics of, of God's Word. God says, guard your heart. You know, you're going to be tempted to let grace and mercy depart. You're going to find a lot of excuses. You're going to have people who will... Uh, Confirm in your mind that not showing grace and mercy is the right thing. God says, guard your heart. Don't be hard-hearted. And the problem is, all of these things are linked. Grace, mercy, and peace. I don't think I know of anybody who doesn't want peace. We want it. And sometimes we'll, we'll afflict others to get it, you know. But each one of these qualities relies on the other. In Hebrews chapter 12, turn there if you would, Hebrews chapter 12 and, and verse 14. We could read the whole chapter, but we'll just read a few verses. Hebrews 12, 14, he says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, there's that same word from Proverbs, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. God tells us to seek peace. Follow peace. Look diligently. Uh, lest you fail of the grace of God. See, he links them, he links them together. But we need to be careful. There's, there's so many things in life. I mean, you know, as I look at our congregation, and, you know, I know each one of you going through things. You have difficulties you're facing. And you have a choice. Uh, you can go with grace and mercy and peace, or you can go with what most people will do. Revenge and all the different things that, that might apply. God says, guard your heart. Don't let that in. Keep the godly qualities characteristic in your life. I can tell you, you know, he talks about Esau and his bitterness. Esau, for some reason, well, I, I know why. God, God oftentimes raised the second son above the first son. And one of the reasons he did that is because of the first Adam and the second Adam. It's a picture. It's a pattern. Yet Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. The second Adam. Well, oftentimes in the families, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't Esau, it was Jacob that God blessed. And so on. And it made him bitter. He would have had a place of blessing, but instead he devalued the things of God and traded them away for a meal. And his bitterness compounded itself. You know, you do the bitter thing and pretty soon, it, what's the old saying? The, the chickens come home to roost. You know, uh, there's results of how we live. And no matter how someone treats us or what our situation is, is in life, we need to guard our heart. You know, you give in to one, uh, one step of going the wrong way and, and pretty soon it leads to another and another and, and then it compounds itself. God says, follow peace. He says, do it diligently, lest you fail of the grace of God. And I can tell you, uh, bitterness is never of the Lord. Look at James chapter 3 and verse 14. It should be just a couple pages to your right there. James chapter 3, verse 14. 
You know, the Bible sometimes is just so clear. Other times you read it and think, oh, I wonder what that means. Yeah, I'm reading through the Bible constantly, and there's just something I think, oh, I'll, I'll figure that out later. <laughs> but sometimes it speaks so clearly. I mean, you just can't miss it. And here's one of them, James 3, verse 14. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. You know, I've heard people claim that God was making them do some wicked thing. Have you ever heard that? Some terrible, wicked, you know, they'll kill somebody. Oh, God told me to do it. Listen, that doesn't come from above. That's devilish, he says. For, verse 16, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But what, what is God's wisdom like? The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. And here's the result. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. God wants you to have peace in your heart. He wants you to have peace in your relationships. You know, while you can't change what others do, you can give your heart to the Lord. You can guard your heart. God has, has used prison in Paul's life to give him opportunities to witness and, and to do the things that, that he needed to do. Uh, the life of Joseph in the Old Testament, his brothers selling him, him being a slave, being lied about, put in prison, all of that God had a good purpose that he was working to bring Israel uh, to the place of, of what they needed to be. And we just don't know what God is doing, but we can know that God wants our heart. Whatever our situation, whatever our circumstance, God's wisdom is different than the world's wisdom. We don't need envying and strife. We don't, uh, we don't need those things. We need the wisdom that's from above. And number one, it's pure. Then peaceable. And he lists a whole group of things there. Guard your heart. God offers grace, mercy, and peace. Who wouldn't want that? And yet our selfishness, you know, we, we fight against ourselves. I'm trying to think that, that, that verse, those that oppose themselves, God talks about. We do the same thing. We want grace, mercy, and peace, and yet we let bitterness and anger and strife in, into the, our hearts and think, God, why don't I have grace, mercy, and peace? Guard your heart. Don't let grace, mercy, and, and peace escape. Don't let the opposite take their place. Over and over he, he talks about these. In 2 John he says, Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father and truth and love. They come from God. It's the only place we can, we can source them. In uh, Proverbs 23 he says, My son, give me thine heart. The heart is a fundamental issue and we all deal with it every day. Now you can get discouraged and give up. Or you can trust the Lord. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. But you know, the first question I would ask this morning is, are you saved? Have you given him uh, your heart? Are you part of his kingdom? Is he your Lord? The Bible says there, has, there needs to be a time and place when you trusted Christ as your Savior. It's not something that creeps up on you. <laughs> it's an experience. Now, I have heard of ladies who had babies who didn't know they were pregnant. You ever read that in the news? You think, how could that happen? But anyway... Um, uh, the Bible talks about it, the new birth. And I think some people are surprised when they get saved. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a definite thing. The Bible talks about it as a birth. Are you saved? But secondly, are you right with the Lord? When he says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. What are the issues that are coming out of your life? What are the things that, uh, that you're, uh, you're going through? What goes out of your life will depend on what's in your life. God can change your heart. Only God can change your heart. It's time to do some soul searching and see. And God says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You know, it's a lot easier to apply these to other people than to ourselves. But you, me, all of us. Uh, this is a message from God to you, to me. And I don't know what, what God might want to do in your heart this morning. But I know what God's doing in my heart. And uh, you know what a blessing it is that uh, we can give our heart to the Lord. And He'll value it and use it and, and bless it. We're going to take our songbooks and sing that verse that I just gave you.